With spring around the corner, nothing says out with the old and in with the new more than a good closet cleanup and a manic clothes shopping spree afterwards. Not for me though, I'm still rocking this thrifted steel I found in the second hand bin. See, I look like a Ferrari. And these are my Rolls Rolls. Well, you can't see them in their full glory because I'm wearing very exquisite shapewear I bought in a grocery store. I would blame the production budget for being so cheap, but I prefer to think that I'm doing my part in saving the environment. Clothing is one of the easiest forms of self-expression and when the most accessible way for you to express yourself and to be viewed and liked on social media is through Western fashion, then that does shape the identity of an entire generation. I think there are many advantages to having access to fashion, but also there's a really big cost in terms of labor and in terms of environment and you're left with a question like, what can I do to be an ethical consumer? We are constantly eroding our natural resource bases as human beings. Fast fashion uh, business case is really one of the most burdensome. It's actually a consumer mentality that needs to change where it cannot be I click a button and I receive the fashion and the trend. That's the part that needs to change. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a talk show with guests from all over Europe. Here we discuss things that working class communities and climate activists have been protesting about for years. We just weren't paying attention until the hipsters started to. I'm Reka Kingapop, editor-in-chief of said Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show, and a co-founder of Display Europe, a new platform offering you articles, audio and video content across 15 languages. Just how black turtlenecks, white button-ups, and well-fitted denim jeans manage to remain in style, so too does our digital production. Another timeless piece that you get to watch in your respective standard time. And today we are discussing, well, you guessed it, fast fashion. Glitter, crop tops, and big buckle belts are all in this year. Or was that already 2012? Or I don't know, 1995? It's hard to keep up with the latest trends when they keep rapidly changing, but retail stores promise to keep you on top of what's in. They mass produce garments in no time so we can all replicate the latest runway looks. Reading Vogue or other fashion magazines is no longer required. You just have to go window shopping or observe strangers on the subway who look like they just rolled off the factory lines. Look, I'm all for equality, but didn't capitalism promise that we would get to be our own unique individual selves? Just like it promises cheap labor to keep up with high market demands without giving a hoot of the real costs of said cheap labor. Approximately 80 billion pieces of clothing are consumed every year, with almost 85% of that amount ending up in landfills annually. This impacts the entire globe with its increased carbon emissions as well as the toxic waste dumped into bodies of water. But the communities living in the affected regions always bear the brunt of the adverse effects. Garment workers are subjected to horrible working conditions and work often below the poverty line. With the rise of climate awareness and workers' protests, many companies turn to greenwashing to promote themselves as sustainable while continuing their exploitative practices. Yet activists and NGOs refuse to settle for pretense. They want to structurally challenge the fast fashion industry. And they lobby for stricter legislation, industry transparency, and propose alternatives that allow us to reimagine how we consume the clothes on our backs. Yet the opportunities for designers to create ethically sourced pieces seems to be ever shrinking. And I can't help but wonder, where do we go from here? From catwalks to sweatshops, from thrifting culture to upcycling enthusiasts, could there exist an in-between space that allows for the creative cooperation between style and conscious consumption? With all these nuances, many still remain hopeful in creating a sustainable industry where fashion can still thrive. Let's see what our guests think. 
Gertrude Klaffenböck received her diploma in agricultural economics from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, and later a Master's of Science in Ecotoxicology and Environmental Management at the FH Technikum Vienna. After a long career in both Südwind and Fian, Austria, she now works as a coordinator for the Clean Clothes Campaign, which aims to improve labor rights in the global clothing industry. Laura Stefanut is a Bucharest-based investigative journalism and a 2019 Milena Jesenska Fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. She is also the founder of Haine Curate, which provides legal assistance to garment workers in Romania and informs them about their rights. Her stories about the Eastern European garment industry have appeared in outlets like Reuters, Balkan Insight and Arte TV and, of course, Eurozine. And she is currently working on a book about EU garment workers. Meha Jajaria is a Kolkata and Vienna-based multimedia visual artist currently doing their master's in biomathematics at the University of Vienna. They research methods of using climate change trajectories to track developments in political movements with the help of mathematical modeling. Meha is also the co-founder and organizer of Spice Mixers, a Vienna-based collective dedicated to curating dance floors for QT BIPOC diaspora. Very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We want to talk about fashion and we want to talk about, of course, when it comes to fashion and fast fashion, the garment industry. Can we talk about how fast fashion and globalized fashion industries affect our cultural identities and how we view ourselves? Growing up, um, I did like Zara as a brand, for example, was something that I viewed as a luxury item. And when I moved abroad, it was culture shock to me to learn that Zara is actually considered something like fast fashion. When I was growing up, it was not something that was accessible to me. And in today's day and age, you can see that that dynamic has shifted because things like H&M and Zara are particularly pitched to the currently growing middle class in India. And there is definitely a huge cultural trend and shift into youngsters wearing more and more Western fashion and not traditional clothing. Clothing is one of the easiest forms of self-expression and when the most accessible way for you to express yourself and to be viewed and liked on social media is through Western fashion, then that does shape the identity of an entire generation. It, it's an aspirational thing. Mm -hmm. Natalia Melman Petrozella recently published an article titled We're All Preppy Now, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting thing to observe and very problematic that... Um, many of these fast fashion brands which are considered on the sort of uh, upper middle class side they are imitating like a 60s 70s ideal mm -hmm. of the anglo-saxon prep school across class identities cultural identities any kind of background this is viewed as a, a tool when you are in a foreign place and trying to establish yourself as equal or, or as fitting in today social media can also be considered a foreign realm and at the end of the day if I'm wearing something like this and posting a video on Instagram I'm only relatable to my own population versus if I'm wearing like a crop top and jeans then I am immediately um, uh, like my content is then globally accessible then creates a big demand for young influencers and young people to want to look a certain way the prices that brands like H&M bring to India are very competitive and there's no other local retailer that produces garments of the same quality and the same style at the same price. So then the Indian middle class has the, the most easiest option for them to go for to access these Western styles are these fast fashion brands then. You have been researching garment industry workers in Romania and their place in this vast European wage vacuum. We must talk about garment industry workers and their working conditions globally. But we should anchor this, that this is, uh, this is a problem present in the EU itself. So when I started to cover the topic of garment factories in my home country in Romania, in, in Bulgaria, a neighboring country, I thought I would find some small you know, problems, but then what I did find and what was shocking is, is that I found very similar stories to what you see in Asian countries and very systemic. So this was the first shock that inside the EU you have exploited workers 
And the second shock was that I found out that it's not only fast fashion brands, it's also luxury brands. Because you think you get it made in the EU, then it has to be fair trade. Well, it's not. It's not okay for the environment and not for the workers. And I can say I experienced conditions in factories by also working myself as an undercover journalist. The, the work is so, so hard. And, and especially during summertime when it's so hot and workers are like fainting constantly. I mean, there were, it was something so common that they were actually disregarding as a really big problem. There are, as, you've, as you've mentioned here, I think there are many advantages to having access to fashion, you know. Um, but also there's a really big cost in terms of labor and in terms of environment. And you're left with a question like, what can I do to be an ethical consumer? You know? Then we come to the ecological cost of the garment industry. And arguably, the horrific labor conditions have characterized the garment industry since it existed as a mass industry. Let's come back to this very soon, but let's talk about the ecological toll of this industry. I think it's generally known that um, the burden is rather heavy in terms of water, water that is used for producing, for example, jeans or a, a T-shirt. Uh, but the next um, burden is, of course, the chemicals that are uh, spread all over the textiles, all over the, the garment. And it's not only that the workers are affected, it's also the shopkeepers uh, and, the, and the vendors. that, And also, as, as as a consumer, I think if you wear those t-shirts, um, skins are affected and actually the ecological burden using the raw materials. Fast fashion is, has really sp spread globally in the 2000 years. It could but not have been happening without synthetic uh, fibers that, that's made from crude oil. See, I dress to represent this because everything on my person is synthetic. <laughs> I thrifted all of them, I'm like the poster child for all the harmful materials now. My, my skin can't bear synthetics, so I, I, I really prefer natural fibers. Difficult yeah, in, in, in terms of land use, in terms of uh, natural resources that are going into these fibers. The fast fashion uh, business case is really one of the most burdensome. Within Europe, Sarah couldn't do it, that, that kind of fast fashion model that they are doing without transporting it via aircraft. And this is an extra burden when it comes to uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions. Like you told us in the, be at, in the beginning that it's also part of identity, yeah? so that everyone feels like you have to rush in to be part of this group, of this society. <laughs> And now, a word from today's sponsors. This program is supported by my aunt, Kotti. She provides me with pickles and bacon, which keep me going through a long working day. Thanks, Aunt Kotti. Please come visit me in Vienna. You've been promising for months. You can also become a supporter of the show, and you don't even have to feed me. All I ask is that you pledge your support at patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is, Eurozine, the magazine presenting this program. You can pledge anywhere, starting from as little as three euros a month or whatever you can afford. You know, go crazy if you can, and I promise we won't buy pickles from them. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, even invitations to the tapings of the show, and you will even get to suggest topics and questions. On average, there is about 84 billion um, clothing uh, production that's happening in the world. In theory, there should be enough clothes being produced so that everyone can wear a new outfit every day of the year. But that's clearly not happening. If you buy a white t-shirt from Kanye West for $200, $300, or if you buy a white t-shirt from H&M for $300, they are both being produced in the same production houses. Fast fashion was a concept started by Zara and like put forward by brands like H&M and Shein. At the end of the day, like it's the same production houses except that luxury brands have a much higher um, profit margin. In reality, their production houses and the conditions for the workers in their production houses did not change. What I see is a phenomenon that luxury brands started moving to uh, countries where workers are paid less so they can have bigger profit margins. And meanwhile, factories are fighting among each other to offer the lowest price. 
and the pressure is mostly moved on the workers. They have to work more on less money. But the factories as well, they're not very well. You know, many are closing, and I'm talking thousands. Wages per sewn item are very, very far from the wage that you are entitled to based on the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that you are pressured for more productivity and that quote unquote productivity is going to result in very severe accidents. This is not a safe industry whatsoever. Sometimes I feel, you know, this kind of marketing machinery that's, go, that's constantly addressing us. It has also been enabled by a political framework. Like in a country like Romania or Bulgaria, it should be not be allowed that there are people working below the living wage uh, uh, level. You know, the worst part is that when I talk to factory owners and I ask them, but how much would you need more, you know, in order to give like proper wages to people? Two euros, five euros per product or something like this, you know, and we're talking about luxury shoes, for example, that sell like in thousands of euros. Most of the consumers would probably agree to pay it, you know, to pay a bit more, you know, for the worker. They're not given the opportunity because the brands, they just want very high profits. Like, you know, the CCC does a clean clothes campaign, does a wonderful job here because it tackles many, many aspects, the political, you know, the social, the, and it really helps the cause. When the industry is pressuring workers to work for less and less, that's not because of cost or prices, that's because increasing profit margins. Most of the industry is actually outside of Europe and experiencing very dire conditions. You know, uh, the history of textile production in South Asia in general is very political. That was used for independence, where it was like, we are going to produce our own cloth that is made by our own cotton, by our own people, and we're not going to buy the cloth resold to us by the British. The thing is that, you know, in the past, like for example, the East India Company was the, was the starting point of colonization in South Asia. It was a company. And in today's day and age, it's, it's the same thing that's happening. It's again companies that are creating these colonial systems in place, but they are smarter because they're like, we don't have to own the land, we can just contract. And then there's no need to take on any responsibility for wages, for worker conditions, nothing. In 2013, workers' disaster that happened in Bangladesh, the Rana Platz mm -hmm. in incident, where more than 1,100 people died. After this, there were many uh, like sanctions and thing and and like international pressures to create better conditions for workers. However. The industry, the local industry, does not have the infrastructure set up to actually create these conditions. And that ends up killing smaller businesses and smaller factories. An alternative to this, instead of somebody in the West just saying that, hey, do this and this and this for your workers, is to actually set up focus groups to see what is actually needed to create livable conditions for workers. But there is a lot of practicalities involved, like space, resources. I did ask a lot of workers, like they're in the hundreds, like, what do you want most? <laughs> Um, and there were two things that came up. Uh, first is like uh, decent salaries that we can live on because they cannot live on the salaries they have. They have to have different jobs or they have to have a partner. Um, and uh, uh, some respect, that's like some respect, you know. Fashion or garment is a driving force of exploitation. How can we think in reverse terms? Is this possible to reverse engineer or even rethink these pro procedures? My humble and not economic background understanding is that everything is externalized. These factories, sometimes manufacturers sort of, um, don't have the money to invest to change these conditions. But why are they the ones to have to invest in this if the demands are increasing all the time? Especially young designers are now really st uh, try to, to start to, to find other business, ca business cases and to, to really find other uh, production lines that go, that really are more respectful towards the workers uh, and also more respectful towards nature. And of course, what we see now also is uh, this kind of contradicting tendency like uh, ultra fast fashion like she in and but also that more and more young people go prefer to, to buy second hand clothes we really have to to go back to really make 
companies accountable. It's, it, it's hurting to the nature, it's hurting to humanity, and, especially, and the, the most suffering group, more or less, is really women and children. This kind of hidden child labor is increasing with this, because if you can't, can't uh, live on a wage of a few Euro, euros per month, then of course you can't pay the school fees. This is really um, a kind of like abuse of the future. It's very problematic to impose some kind of a human rights ideal on from, from, let's say, economic centers and say you should ban child labor if those children can't make ends meet and don't have anything to eat and there's no available education in the place, right? So it, it's a, it seems to be sort of a double-edged sword which both ways slashes the vulnerable communities. The foam production industry, like making polyurethane foam, which is really bad for the environment, through Western imposed sanctions, the Indian government imposed certain laws where they were like X, Y, and Z chemical is no longer allowed. However, for the production of polyurethane foam, there's no alternative chemicals available. So then the production of foam now in India is mostly outsourced. Oftentimes the fashion industry or fashion is talked in these very heavily gendered terms as if it was something frivolous. Uh, from a consumer level, this is a project that involves maybe finding your own personal sense of fashion so that you don't have to follow weekly trends to feel relevant and to feel beautiful. You can follow influencers and people who actually teach you to find your own personal style and then your wardrobe can consist of 10 statement pieces and then you can just keep wearing that and then you have your own style, your own personal sense of expression and you are not having 50 garments in your closet that you are constantly throwing. Hey there, let me just flag you up someone who is a personal favorite of mine, easily the favorite podcaster of mine in the whole wide world. She's a colleague and a partner, Claire Potter, a professor emeritus of history from the New School for Social Research in New York. She was the co-founder of Public Seminar, one of our partners um, in the Eurozine Network, and her Substack called Political Junkie and her podcast called Why Now are fantastic. So if you like these kinds of in-depth and entertaining conversations, you're going to love everything that Claire does. Subscribe to her Substack, listen to her podcast, and just tell her that you love her because she deserves all good things in the world. Now back to the program. So I came, came to understand fashion from this angle that I both didn't have the money to buy serious clothing of, uh, of my taste, whatever that was at the time, uh, and I also didn't fit the ideals. And probably for this reason, I personally never really developed a good understanding of this necessarily permanent change of fashion. Um, just because if you are excluded from it and you can't do it anyway, then from the outside, clothes being outdated doesn't really make sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or for me at least it doesn't make sense, culturally. Yeah, um, fashion is also seen as a kind of the really old uh, model of um, plant obsolescence. For a long time there were two seasons, then there were four seasons. Now with globalization, this and fast fashion, it is, we are up to 52 seasons or so. It creates m mountains of waste. Now uh, there's a kind of growing movement um, due to the climate problems already. It might take time that it changes. Meha, from the artist's point of view, how would you guide someone just trying to get an understanding of the concept of fashion and as you mentioned, like getting, getting a sense of your style or even basically a sense of yourself? Something that I realized as a designer is that there is like two versions to the story. Um, if I want to do things sustainably, and not exploit anyone as, as part of my brand, then the turnover, the production time, becomes much bigger. And for me, as a, as a young designer, the, the easiest way for me to sell my product is through Instagram. And people expect you to have a stockpile ready. And that's not possible. I cannot produce 
like either I'm sewing the clothes myself or I'm, I'm contracting cheap labor because I don't have the resources to produce that amount of product on my own. So it's actually a consumer mentality that needs to change where it cannot be I click a button and I receive the fashion and the trend. But on a consumer level, it was really a learning process for me to be like, you know what, I actually need to take the time to see my body, to learn what my body needs in terms of visual representation and then buy only those products. Because it's very easy to go into H&M or something and to pick up like 15 different clothings and come home and then be like, okay, now I'm going to try a bunch of different outfits and see what works. No, that, mm. that cannot be. But also, I don't want to be someone who tells someone that go back to your roots. No, do whatever you want. But educate yourself because the information is out there. If you just type fast fashion into Instagram, you, you will find tons of info, infographics that are just saying just basic facts. So you, the information is out there and you can know and then you can be a more informed consumer. Mm. We shouldn't order people to go back to their roots, but I would rather those roots weren't weeded out because they cool. contain a lot of information, technology mm -hmm. and a culture Absolutely. and an understanding of what clothing means on a body. And, and here, very specifically, I, I talk about folk apparel, clothes that you have to be able to work in, clothes that you have to be able to walk in or ride in or whatever, have this demand of durability and, and renewability and retailering it. Yeah. Yeah. Is this something yeah. that you think we can introduce Absolutely, yeah, fully. in the mindset? I'm sure, I'm sure. I think younger people are actually really uh, very passionate in, in looking for this. Actually, from my basic uh, academic uh, education, I'm an ag agricultural economist, and I did my first research project on the historical culture of linen production in the, uh, in the north of Austria. And it was really interesting to see how you still can see in the landscapes the, this historical uh, production landscape, more or less. No? It was only in the 1970s that the last linen fields disappeared in this air, in this region. It's it's just two ten generations now that it's really gone. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a growing interest to really uh, recapture it. Uh, I really do agree that, that actually we should cultivate this kind of like uh, perspective, yeah? that yeah. there's a, a history behind each of the pieces. The reason why I said that I don't want to tell somebody to go back to their roots because everybody wants to feel like they're part of the new world, you know, the older ways of production of cloth and things like that. I think from a designer perspective, in a sense, there is a market for it because you see it in the secondhand industry in Europe, in, in Vienna, for example. You can buy a secondhand worn out jacket that has holes in it for 45 euros. The consumer would pay mm -hmm. for material that they think that is sustainable. But then again, it, it, it's also a point that the secondhand markets in Europe are really expensive and not really affordable for a lot of people. Well, sometimes I think, you know, fast fashion companies really go into this field so that to extend their value chain more or less. The pieces that I didn't get from, uh, from some girlfriends or didn't inherit from somewhere are almost entirely exclusively thrifted uh, secondhand in my wardrobe. But... I would wager that like nine tenths out of it wouldn't exist if it weren't for the fast fashion industry. So the reason those pieces make it to a secondhand shop is specifically this overconsumption. So I feel like mm -hmm. this is a very weird circle. Mm -hmm. I do ask myself, what can I do, you know? I mean, I did some stuff, I did some investigations, I'm trying to support workers, um, but the answer is that I don't have the final answer. You know, what I can tell anybody is like, you should buy less, first of all. At some point I thought like, second hand would be a good solution. It's not that much chemicals in the, in the clothes, you know, it's like you have, you can help uh, smaller businesses. But then again, in Romania, for example, we have a huge problem with waste. I, I guess this is not, this, not the solution, but this is going to be part of the solution. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. 
This talk show is a Display Europe production, a content sharing platform that offers you content on politics, culture, community, and so much more, and somehow, miraculously, doesn't abuse your user data. Shocker, I know. Now, if you like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as three euros a month or whatever you can afford. In return, you'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the taping of the show, or even get to suggest topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe Program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the authors and the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACAE can be held responsible for them. We also thank the Alte Schmiede for hosting us today.